be watching otherwise. I, it's kind of something I've requested. Somebody asked me that, how do you, how do you answer somebody of a different religion or different faith, uh, like, a, like a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness? I saw one a couple of, well, about 10 days ago in El Dorado. Something just pulled on my heart to say, go talk to these men and tell them that, that, uh, that you, you love them and you want them to seek the truth too, that, that they know that they are trying sincerely to worship God. And John 4.24 says, we must worship Him in truth and in spirit. Must is the key word. Because if you're not, you're worshiping a different God. Uh, and like Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, uh, many are going to come to him on that day and say, Lord, Lord. And he says, you know what, I don't even know you. And I want to prevent that from happening to anybody that is worshiping a different God. Unless you've got the right Jesus, you've got the wrong Lord. So uh, I kind of went up and talked to him, and I, had, I came up with some questions. That some of them were from sincerity because I don't want to browbeat. No one was ever argued into the truth. No one was ever shoehorned into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, no one has ever debated into uh, seeing error. But they are won over with reasoning from the scriptures because all scripture is given for reproof, correction. Uh, you know, it's to bring a man and a woman to understanding of the truth and what that truth is. And, and God's word is truth. So I had some questions that I want to ask. For example, if I met, I met some Jehovah Witnesses, and I left actually a Bible track on there, are you, are you a good person? They were out canvassing the neighborhood, and I clicked and put a Bible track on their windshield, and I noticed I watched them and see when they came back, it was, oh yeah, and they put it in their pocket. So hopefully that will uh, penetrate their heart and show them that nobody is really a good person. Uh, the, the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, bless their heart, actually depend upon works uh, to get into the kingdom. And I want to show them that the truth is that nobody can do enough good works that's all the world's religions, all other religions outside Christianity is about do, do, do. And with Christ, it's done. It is finished. Paid in full. So, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that there's one God. And that God is not a trinity. And you know what? My family, there are three of us living at home tonight. There is one wellman, but there are three persons. So you can have three in one. Yes. Okay? It's one God. Uh, God said in the beginning, let us make man in our image. So the, the definition of God is, is that it's plural. In, the, in Genesis, that is us. Elohim is plural. It's like the Wellmans. I'm putting an S on our last name. There's many of us. So one of the questions is, who is God speaking to in the garden? If he said, let us make man in our image. Why didn't he say, let me make God in my image? See the difference? So, and like the Mormons too, they also believe that there is only one God. They, they do not believe that there is a full trinity in person. They believe that Jesus became God, and we believe that God became man. Okay, that's a big difference. So, I, I really have to uh, depend on the, on the Bible, because if I ask them the question, one of these scriptures would say that they believe that God is one person. Jehovah's Witnesses say, and, and what I would do is I would turn to Matthew 28 verse 19. And, and I'm not going to try to, to win a debate. I'm not trying to browbeat them and say, you guys are wrong and I'm right. I'm going to let the Word of God do the convicting and the Holy Spirit do the Word uh, into their hearts and to show them the truth. I can't do that. I'm only human. Matthew 28 verse 19. Go therefore and teach. And really the word teach is really the same. Make disciples. Make disciples. That doesn't mean just teach them how to work. If you make disciples, you, the other disciples then will make other disciples. We're supposed to be disciples of Christ. Disciple meaning a, a student or a learner. Disciple, the, the tendency is to discipline. I need a little bit of discipline. A lot of, well, maybe more than a little. I need a lot of discipline. Here is saying, Jesus is telling them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, capital, pronoun, proper noun, of the Son, that is Jesus, capitalized, that's a proper noun. In the Greek writes it as a proper noun. And the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Holy, so those are three people with a proper noun. It is not a spirit force, like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe this, that they believe the Spirit of God is a force. 
But the Bible speaks of, about Jesus said, He will come to you. He will teach you all things. He is the advocate. Those, all those have capital letters, proper name. The Greeks didn't say, well, let's look. I feel like capitalizing this because it's, it's, it's not good English. If unless you're defining somebody as a person and you're not giving uh, proper respect to somebody. If I call Lisa and I give her a letter, I'm going to put the capital L in front of her name because I show she's a, she's a proper person. She's a, a person and I want to respect her for that. So that is, a, that is really a false teaching that God is not uh, a trinity, that he's not, uh, that he's only one, because the Bible, and I'm only picking one, there's a lot of other places that show that the, the trinity is all three distinct persons, like Martha Mary and I, all distinct persons, we're all one family, but we're all totally different. That's true. Okay, also they believe that, as they said, I said earlier, the Holy Spirit is a force, uh, and I'm going to turn to John 14, 26, and I kind of touched on that a little bit. Now these are these are verses that you can just kind of think about about how to answer someone that might come up with you and give you a watchtower and say this is very interesting. May I ask you a question and and put it in that way and do it polite as a caring person, uh, as someone that that wants no one to perish. It is it is uh, God's will that none perish and that no one be uh, separated from God. So that should be our desire. I'm not there to say that, you know, you guys are right, wrong and I'm right. It is not me that's right. My opinion is no better than Oprah Winfrey now. Uh, and it's, unless I depend on the Word of God. And I'm going to stand on the Word of God. Because there is no error in the Word of God. In, in John 14, 26, and this is one I could just about memorize here. You know, I, I noticed that a lot of this goes back to John and not our elder John. Although I would trust him fully in that. That his experience and his wisdom in the scriptures is good. But the book of John, the, the, the Apostle John, in 1426. Okay, if the Holy Spirit is just a, a force, and it's an impersonal, active force, they say it's an impersonal, why would Jesus say that they were concerned? When Jesus was going away, they were concerned that they were going to leave there. I will not leave you orphans, he said. But... Uh, but the comforter, mine is capitalized. The comforter is a proper noun. That's another name for the Holy Spirit, comforter. In which the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, again, capitalized in my Bible, and in the Greek, it is capitalized. The Greeks don't capitalize a name unless they're naming somebody that exists. Okay? If it's an impersonal, uh, it's an impersonal being, or an inactive, or an impersonal force, when they give a, a proper a capitalization to something that's just a force, like the wind. I wrote about the it was very windy today, and the wind, I would not capitalize that. Because it's not a person. It's a thing. It's a noun. This is a proper noun. So a comforter will come, and the, the Father will send him, and the really, it should say, send him in my name, and he, not it, he will teach you all things and bring to you all things your remembrance. Is something or a person, impersonal force going to help you remember something? My wife was trying to help me remember uh, where my car keys were at. And, and you know, she was a, she's a proper noun and, she's a, and she was reminding me. Is, is the wind or some noun going to remind me of bring remembrance to it? No. See how the impossibility of that is? That, that the more you read the scriptures, the more you see that the Holy Spirit is a person. Next, they believe, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, that, that uh, Jesus, the only begotten Son was, was Jesus, was used, uh, that He uh, was used in Jehovah, who created all things. Now, he, in other words, what I'm saying, they believe that Jesus was the brother, half brother, or was originally, I should say, Michael the Archangel. Maybe you knew that. My question would be to them is, If he was an angel, are we supposed to worship angels? No. Clearly not. In Revelation uh, 3 9, and in fact, I had to, I had to hone it down because they, I had lots of places where they worship Jesus. And, and in fact, uh, in, Revel in Revelation 19, 10, I'll, I'll jump in there real quick. It says that an angel came to John and he said, and John fell at his feet, and the angel said, See that you do not do this. I'm a fellow servant. He was an angel. He's a created being. 
of your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So worship God. You're not supposed to worship angels. Uh, the same thing, basically. Uh, and they, they would come down and worship Jesus at, at Revelation 3, 9. I will make them to come and worship before your feet. And, my, and, and other places, Hebrews 1, 6. I know I'm covering a lot of them, but these are... I, that's why I kind of left you a, a handout so you can kind of look at that, but some of this is crystal clear. When you look at the scriptures... And, and you know, another thing is too, if, if Jesus was an angel and God created the angels, correct? Okay. Yeah. Hebrews 1, 6 says, and again, when he, be, when he bringing the, the first begotten in the world, he said, let all the way, angels of God worship him. So the angels of God worshiping, that is not letting another angel worship other angels. So the angels were worshiping him. If he was an angel, when he, when he brought in or created the angels, it makes no sense that, that they would worship someone that was supposedly an angel, Michael the Archangel. And, and if indeed he was a created being or an angel, then I would like to know in 1 John it says that he, there was not anything, John 1, John 1, verse 3. All things were made by Him. This Him was the Word of God. The Word of God was flesh. The Word of God was flesh, not the Word of God became flesh. The Word was God, and the Word was not a God, but was God. So, in verse 3, all things were made by Him. Without Him, there was not anything that was made. Since Michael's an angel, and he was created, how could he have existed before him to create himself? So uh, my question would be, since Christ is said to be creator of all things, which it also says in Colossians 1, 16 and 17, and I think that's in your handout too, that there was not anything that was made that was not made by him. Anything in the Greek is meaning all things, all things, meaning everything that has been ever created. The question I have would be, if he created all things, and he was a created being, wouldn't he have had to exist before he was created? How could someone that had existed from all time create himself, otherwise he would have already existed before? I know that's a little, that's a brain, that's a brain twister, but... What really irritates me, and I have to say this is one part, that they say that Jesus is not a perfect man. Oh, that's a lot. In their book, Reasoning from the Scriptures, page 309, they say Jesus was, was not God in the flesh. Although we just read, God became flesh. He was, the Word in the beginning was God, and the Word became flesh. The Word is another word for Jesus, because it talks about, and, and Him the light of, was the light of, of the world, and he, he, was, he was in the world, and the world was made by Him, in verse 11, or verse 10. So, I have a really difficult time because if he's not if he's not a perfect man, then you're still in your sin, and they and they have no perfect savior. So if he's not a perfect man, tell me why. And it's one I can memorize. I've already memorized in Second Corinthians five twenty one. He who knew no sin, no sin became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness. Of God. So if he's not a perfect man, then you guys don't believe he's a perfect, but he came, became perfect. Then that means he was not perfect to begin with. And if he's not perfect to begin with, he was not God. And if he's not sinless, he's not the perfect sacrifice. And so we can rip out 2 Corinthians 5.21. Because he became righteousness for our sake. He who knew no sin. Knew is the past, present, and it means that he never, ever in any sense, so. Praise the Lord. 
Another thing is that Jesus, they believe that, and, and, and Jehovah Witness, I would ask you this, my friend, in loving, compassionate, caring for the truth, that Jesus did not rise from the dead. He did not, have a, he did not rise from the dead in the physical body. And I'm going to turn to Luke 24. You know what? I'm already there because it's right next to John. John 1. Jesus did not rise from the dead from a physical body. And so I would, I would ask them. And uh, Luke 24, verse 39. Behold, my hand. Remember when Thomas came there? He said, I will not believe. And, and not our deacon Thomas. But, uh, real, Thomas is, is, young, is a lot younger than that, okay? I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, too, because I'm in my 60s. and I'm, I was not quite around when the dead scene was still alive, okay? I'm not that old, but I feel like my age. Like, but. Remember Thomas said, unless I touch his hands or, or touch his... Remember he talked about touching him and touching the... Behold my hands, in Luke 24, 39, that is, I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see me have. Uh-huh. Wait a second. He does have flesh and bones. This was after the resurrection, about, Paul wrote, uh, more than 500 saw him. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. And what... Yet there they believed not for joy and wonder and unto him have you not any meat? You know what? He said, Give me a piece, give him a piece of royal fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he ate it. Can spirit if, if can spirit eat for another thing? If you were a spirit and you were not flesh and blood, if you ate something, it would have dropped to the ground. Because there's so the, the main verse though I wanted to though I would ask this, since you believe that, that Jesus was not raised from the dead in a physical body. Why would you say, why would you say, handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see I have. He's saying, I have flesh and bones. How clear is that? They believe that Jesus was raised a, not a human creature, but a spirit. But as a spirit, John talked about the spirit in John 3, and he says the spirit goes here and there, and you see it not. So they were seeing Jesus. Remember, he thought you got to be born again, and you know, born of the spirit. So the wind, is like you compare the spirit, like the wind, you see, you you know, you don't see it, but it goes wherever it wants to. So they actually believed that Jesus was born again. Now that's kind of amazing to me because he was born of a virgin, but he was not born again. He says he told Nicodemus. In John 3, 3, you must be born again. Okay, you remember that. He must be born again. He never pointed back to his own self. I must be born again. And this was before the cross. Yeah. It's hard for me to understand how Jesus was born again. I know we need to be born again. And that is born from above, the, the literal translation of it. So, And they also believe he didn't die on, on, a, on the cross. He believed he died on a stake. My question is, and they teach that, is does it matter where he died? But that he died. I don't have so much an issue that he died not on a cross, although the scriptures are pretty clear. And sometimes it references that as a tree because the tree is made of, of timber. And Peter and uh, James sometimes talk about it uh, as a tree. But that we talked about that last week if you were here about... Cursed is every man that's on a tree. We talked about the tree in the Garden of Eden, and he reversed the curse in the tree. And so it, it's a symbolism of, of, of talking about the cross. The cross is not made out of, from, you know, from my or, or plastic or metal. It's a tree. It's made from a tree. So, And finally, Jesus began his invisible rule. Back in 1914, Jesus, they, they believe, and I would say if he, Jesus has made his invisible rule beginning then what about the scripture that say every eye shall see him and every time shall confess? So, to me, uh, I, I, those are good questions that I have for them. And, you know, the, the one older man, and finally, that, that was with these, these two men that I talked to, uh, 
just said that he, he says, I think we're, we're finished and, and we appreciate talking to him. The young man, I could see the guy looked a little bit puzzled by it. So maybe I planted the seed in him to, to make him examine the scriptures. I said, Probably you know, so. it, it, my opinion is worthless, but if you look at the word of God, that's, that's what's most important uh, in my opinion. So, And I'll just barely touch on, on the Mormon belief because I'm not going to have time to finish this. But I, I, And I want to do the same thing there because the Book of Mormon is said to be uh, history of the church, page 461. They say the Book of Mormon is more correct than the Bible. And I said, well, then Psalm 19.7 says the law of God or the word of God is perfect, converting to soul. So is that not right? Mm -hmm. Is the word of God perfect, or the law of God perfect, or is it not? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says kind of the same thing, that all scripture is God-breathed. And so if all scripture is God-breathed, and it's God's breath, meaning, meaning it's from the mouth of the word of God, and it's not as correct as a human book, a book of woman, then I guess I have a problem believing it, so... Also, the devil was said to be born as a spirit after Jesus. So the devil is supposed to be the older brother of Jesus. And they are spirit brothers and siblings. And so I might ask, I, I, in fact, I would go back to Colossians 1. The, you know, the more I look at, at the Bible, the more I see that, uh, that Jesus is the creator of and he's not just, he kept saying, like, there's seven I am's in the book of John. And this is this has never been as clear to me as when I started reading First John about him being the creator of all things in Colossians 1. And I think it is in 16, yes. And, and I'm going to even back up to 15. Who? Who is the image? Jesus Christ is the in image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. The first, the firstborn of every creature does not mean that, that Jesus was born first of all, first of every creation. That, what that means is he's the first in preeminence. He's the first. If you look at the way that the Greek construction there, he is the, he's the preeminence of all things that were born in the Son of God. And that, that refers to, mine refers to the nativity. And so my cross reference does. For by him, in verse 16, Colossians 1 16, were all things created. All things that are in heaven. All things that are on earth. All things visible. That would include spirit. Would you, would you include angels? Would you include everything that is unseen? Yeah. Dominions, principalities, powers, all things created by him and for him. So all things were created in him. And he is before all things. Meaning, he before he came before all things were created. That's what that's saying in verse 17. He was before all things were created. There, there, is, there is no other way around that. And all things by him consist. I like what Dr. McGee once said. He goes, all things consist of him. In other words, everything holds together by him. If he took for a second and let go of all things, would just fly apart. Because scientists don't know how the universe is held together. They have no clue. There's a teaching of uh, Prophet Joseph Smith, and they call him a prophet, but uh, I, I question that too because I think the age of the prophets has come to, come to a, an end, end at the end of the New Te Testament. <clears throat> on God become, on God, on your, are you a good Mormon? You have the potential of becoming a God. I would insert a child. Really, yeah, now you have the potential of becoming a child of God and becoming and living, but everybody is going to live forever. Once a created being, but you have a spirit, is going to live forever, but it's in one place or the other. And I can tell you right now, there are no atheists in hell. Because if they're atheists, 
has been judged. Think about that. There are no atheists in now. Because then they now would believe that it's too late. So the atheist really can't exist because they'd have to know everything that there is in every quantum. They, they would be able to have to see invisible spirit beings or they have to be able to know everything in the entire universe. So technically the atheist doesn't exist because they can't prove that God does not exist. That's impossible for them to prove. But once they are in hell, there will be no atheists that exist in hell because then by that day they, they will know. Like the, the, like the rich man that died, he didn't believe in God apparently, but he does now, and it was too late. So They say, you shall become gods because they have no end. Well, we can become the children of God, and we will have no end. But even if you are separated from God, you will have no end. They believe that, and bless their heart, they believe we are going to become gods and we'll have all power and we'll rule our own planet. The Bible says we will be kings and priests and rule with Christ. And I'm happy with that. Now whether believers in the, in the millennium, and we will expand to the universe, I don't know. But I'm not going to presume out of the Bible something that is, that is where the Bible is silent. And they're actually the God the Father at one time was created. And that's another question that I would have. That, that God is always in, uh, without beginning and without end. And I find, and, and let me finish with one last thing. And I, I want to, and they, I asked them, that, are you guys on your, how near are you toward your, your end of your two year run? You know, they have to do the work. That's part of their mission. That's part of their works. I says, well, is, if you don't finish your two-year run, does that mean you're not qualified for the kingdom of God? And the guy politely said, no. He said, we have to do two years. Uh, it's required. So I said, it's part of your salvation. He said, yeah, if that's what they require. What would you say about Ephesians 2, 8 and 2, 9, where... It is, it's by grace that you've been saved, not of works. But they threw out James, you know, where if a person's faith is dead, and I don't know if I brought that with me, is dead without works. Yeah. And I think it's a misunderstanding because James, they said James says faith without works is dead because it's a faith that's alone. If, if it's a faith that's alone without works, then it is dead. A faith that saves is not one that does, is produced by works, but it works that a person is saved, not by works, but a person that is saved does works. And we prepared beforehand His works for us to do that He might be glorified. So work, works are kind of a natural byproduct of faith. It's not a result of faith. So... You disagree with that if it's by grace you've been saved through faith, it's not by works, because otherwise you can boast. In verse 9 it says otherwise we're going to be boasting and we're not we're not saved by believing. Well, if we could boast, I would boast. If we if we if we could save ourselves by works, then we would be telling everyone about it. So Faith, is, it's a free gift. It's a free gift. I came up and, and gave you a free gift, and you said, okay, I'm going to pay you back. Is it a free gift anymore? No. 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 Just keep those things in mind, and, and you can think about that next time. You might ask it. Maybe you can quote one particular subject out of that scripture. I gave you a list there. One of those that's going to be more particular of interest to you that might be something that really clashes with what you what you believe in your heart and what you know the Word of God says. Uh, and maybe that way we can uh, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within us. And because Jude, the book of Jude says, we must earnestly contend for the faith once delivered. That does not mean browbeat, that does not mean attack them, that does not mean debate them in an argument and, and win them over, but it means in loving, caring, correction and rebuke and reproof from the Word of God because I, I have no answers. The, the Word of God is only the one that I can lean on and show them and then pray for them 
and, and maybe the Holy Spirit will shove in their hair. And that's, that's the only reason I did that. Then I went up to speak to them. And I actually went up to the house that was after that he had just spoken to. And I said, you know, they tell you about Jesus. I said, yes. Let me tell you, they had a different Jesus. And I went ahead and shared the gospel with them. And the guy was saying, you know, it did sound kind of different. So uh, I'm not really out there to try to win an argument. I'm trying to out there to win a lost soul. Father, forgive us for our sins this week, and we ask you to be with us this week to have us a clear understanding of how to rightfully discern the Word of God and to do so loving and caring and compassion. We know you don't want anyone to perish, and we know you desire all men to be saved and all women to be saved, and even the child. We're thankful for this group of body of believers. Thank you for them and for their contributing to the body of Christ. And I pray for them that we all come back safely and return us here safely. And particularly today, in such a long travel day for me, please watch over our travels with these young people. And we ask you to dismiss all the do. Return back next week. The Lord Jesus Christ, holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you.